how can one know that through which everything is known? How can one know the knower? Namaste. So the last time we talked about Brahman as Sat Chit Ananda, unlimited existence, consciousness, and bliss. And we pointed out how every living creature, every sentient being, knows that they exist and are conscious that they are conscious. And this is a property of Brahman, of course. In fact, this is Turiya consciousness, and every living being has it. Most, however, don't realize it because they're covered by ignorance. And this ignorance, upadi, or limiting adjuncts, have another effect, which is that they cover over the unlimited bliss, the ananda of Brahman, and they cause us to think that we're suffering. So today's verses go into this question, which is quite difficult and obscure for most people. Verse 11. Abhane na parang prema, bhane na vishayas priha, atu bhane pyabhata sau, paramananda tatmanaha. If the supreme bliss of the self is not known, there cannot be the highest love for it, but it is there. If it is known, there cannot be attraction for worldly objects, but that too is there. So we say this blissful nature of the self, though revealed, is not, strictly speaking, revealed. Because of this peculiarity, Love for both the self and the objects is found. In case the supreme bliss is not known, there cannot be the highest love for it. But we have this love, therefore its knowledge cannot be denied. But if we know it, the supreme bliss, can we have taste for the enjoyment of material objects? Yet this desire for sensuous pleasure is also a fact. So this supreme bliss is something known and yet unknown, which cannot be according to the law of excluded middle. The answer is, logic must yield to facts of experience. It is everybody's experience that we have this highest love for it, and yet we seek sensuous pleasures. Therefore, we have to admit that it is known and yet not known fully. The next shloka gives an example which clears the enigma. Text 12. Adye trivarga madhyastha putra dhyayana shabdavat bhane pyabhanang bhanasya pratibhande na yujyate. A father may distinguish the voice of his son chanting the Vedas in chorus with a number of pupils but he may fail to note its peculiarities due to an obstruction, that is to say, its having been mingled with other voices. Similar is the case with bliss. Because of obstruction, it is proper to say that the bliss is known yet unknown. Many voices in the chorus were an obstruction for the father to recognize fully the voice of his son, so also the bliss is apprehended in general, but not fully because of obstructions, that is, other loves rooted in ignorance. Text 13. Pratibandhosti bhatiti vyavahar arhavastuni tangnirasya virudhasya tasyotpadanamuchate our experience of the articles of everyday use is that they exist, they reveal. Now, an obstruction is that which stultifies this experience of existence and revelation and produces the counter-experience that they are not existing, 
that they are not revealing. In the last shloka, we have talked of obstruction. Here, its nature is defined. An obstruction is that which hides the nature of a thing and makes it appear as something else. Text 14. Tasya he tu samana bhi hara putra danishratau Ihana dira vidyaiva vyamo haikane bandhanam In the above illustration, the cause of the obstruction to the voice of the sun being fully recognized is the chorus of voices of all the boys. Here, the one cause of all contrary experiences is indeed the beginningless avidya. Avidya is beginningless because beginning implies that an object originated at a particular time, whereas avidya is logically prior to time. So this is very deep. <laughs> no wonder we never hear a discussion of this in presentations on Vedanta. Yet, if we consult our everyday experience, it's true. I know that I exist, I know that I'm conscious, but this bliss thing is kind of difficult to experience fully. Why is that? Well, it must be covered by something. Yes, that covering is called ignorance, avidya. Vidya means knowledge. Avidya is just plain ignorance not knowing. And what do we not know? The fact that we are Brahman alone, and that the whole material existence, the body, the mind, other people, objects, the senses, cause and effect, everything is completely hallucinated, <laughs> completely imaginary. And how is that? because it's an upadi. An upadi is a limiting adjunct that covers and obscures the reality and gives some false impression of what is really there. So the upadi in this case is that the body and mind and senses are suffering. The Buddha compared the whole material existence to nothing but an ocean of suffering. Why? Because the material world is the world of birth and death. Nobody wants to die. We discussed that last time. Because we know deep down, instinctively, that we are existent. So no living entity wants to give up this existence without a fight, without a struggle. At the same time, we know that we're conscious, because consciousness is automatically aware of itself. But, in terms of bliss, even though we love the self more than anything else, and which makes us fight to preserve our existence, still, due to ignorance, we think that our bliss is not complete. So, I need this, and I need that, and I have to go get this thing, and I have to do that, and I have to, you know, struggle in my material existence simply to attain so many objects that I need for my happiness. But, even though we may attain those objects, we find they are not fully satisfactory. This is a terrible enigma, because even though it seems that our bliss is not complete. We can't find the resources to satisfy all these desires. Why? Because we think that we are the body and the mind, and the body and mind are suffering by nature. Birth and death is not natural to the conscious entity. We discussed some time ago that the paradox of material existence is that we have intuitive awareness that we exist unlimitedly, but we do so in an atmosphere of birth and death, of non-existence. 
And so how do we deal with the non-existence of, for example, the body or other material things? Huh? The other day I bought a new computer, a Mac M3. Whoopie-doo, right? But, you know, in five or ten years, it's going to break down and I won't be able to get it repaired and that's going to be the end of it. So even though it's a bright, brand new, shiny tool, yet in some time it's going to go away. And of course, the same is true of all material things, including the body and even the mind. It cannot exist forever. So this goes contrary to our instinctive experience, our intuitive realization of the nature of the self as unlimited existence, consciousness, and bliss. Even though we love the self more than we love anything else, still we think we have to love these other things because the love of the self is not enough. This is ignorance. Only the love of the self, Brahman, can give the complete satisfaction that we are always hankering for. The beginning of this love of self is religion and devotion. But when it matures through meditation and self-realization, one finds a deeper satisfaction that cannot be attained by any other means. People think wrongly that, oh, if I gain wealth and I become rich, then I can be happy without any interruption. But look at the news. Every day there's some news of some rich person being in some kind of trouble, isn't it? We see them misbehaving and doing really stupid things becoming addicted to drugs, having divorces and affairs. So wealth is no cure. Or we may think, oh, I will become very powerful, a dictator, huh? Like that, and then I'll be safe and happy. But no, you're just putting yourself in line for tremendous competition. Everybody wants to take your spot, isn't it? That's no cure either. And the same goes for all the other materialistic opulences, such as beauty, fame, knowledge, renunciation, you know, any kind of religious designation or spiritual realization other than the realization of the self. Realization of self or Brahman, Atman, is that which gives complete satisfaction, ultimate happiness. And the unhappiness that we experience is only because of the vidya, which is beginningless, because for time and space and matter to exist, avidya is a precondition. So avidya is already there before time begins. That's why it's called causeless. Because cause and effect requires time. Huh? Just like we said, the ignorance has to be there before time begins so that time itself can exist because time is ignorance. Space is ignorance. Only the eternal Brahman, unconditioned, boundless, free from any kinds of limitations, is the actual truth. And realizing that Brahman will make us happy forever. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti. Aung Namah Shivaya.